Before we start to dive into details about how to configure the envelope and assign exposures and materials, etc., let's just get our basic workflow or uh, Grasshopper definition set up and let's make sure that all of our data is streaming out to Excel properly and let's see what kind of a result we get when we have just two simple volumes like the one here um, and let's see what we can do in terms of getting that out to a PHPP. So I'm picking up right where we left off in our last video. We have um, just two independent uh, thermal masses or thermal zones, one above the other. They are just, um, you know, simple, typical boxes, uh, you know, poly surfaces um, in Rhino speak. And um, so let's get these now into our grasshopper um, uh, definition and let's push these through into PHPP. So I'm going to come over here to, I'm going to come to my standard ribbon in Rhino and go to grasshopper and launch grasshopper. And let's first start by making a simple honeybee model of this configuration. So we've got two thermal zones here. Let's pull that through into a honeybee model first, and then we'll look at how we get that out to PHPP. All right, so lots of ways we can build honeybee models. Uh, let me come into my ribbon here. Where's honeybee? Not that one. There we go, honeybee. So uh, lots of ways we can make models. Um, from solids, uh, uh, intersecting, etc. You certainly we could use Dragonfly now to make our models from just 2D representations, which is all awesome. I'm going to use this Honeybee face component because I like this one. I think this works really well for the types of models that we're building. So I'm going to use this Honeybee face component, and I'm going to drop that onto the canvas here. So we have our honeybee face component, and now we need to get some geometry in. Notice, but by default, this takes in geometry. Uh, names for the different surfaces, uh, types, wall, roof, ceiling, uh, floor, that would just be a you know a text input, and then boundary conditions as well, uh, either outdoors, ground, or adiabatic. And then of course we can also load in a construction, an energy plus construction type. Um, and and uh, you know that's all basic Honeybee. Uh, so you can check out their documentation for information on any of that. All right, so how are we gonna get the geometry in? Well, we could use a pipeline. We could you know do that in all sorts of different ways. I'm just gonna come in here and select the geometry and let's just make a, a BREP reference, and let's just reference that in as a BREP. And we'll call this second floor. And all I need to do is take this and just drop it in to my geometry, and now Honeybee is gonna go off and make a bunch of uh, uh, geometry, and, and it's smart enough to split that single mass, that polysurface, up into individual faces, so we've got individual, individual face elements. So that's great. Okay, so we've got that much flowing in nicely. And as we talked about last time, uh, it, the next step with uh, any, any um, honeybee model is to then create a room from those individual faces. So, so as output from this guy, I have six individual honeybee faces. I want to combine all of those faces together into a honeybee room. So I put together six faces and that forms a single room object. Notice by default, it's got sort of a big ugly name. So let's name it, let's call it second floor. And I'll put that as input into the name field and notice that uh, Honeybee now names it as second floor. You can name it whatever you want, upper floor, upper story. You can leave it set to the default. Um, it's not gonna, not gonna really matter. Okay, so that's one uh, room. And with any multi-zone uh, model, we're going to have more than one zone. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just make a copy and then say paste. So we're just going to make a mirror. We're going to make a copy of everything there. But this time, we're going to call this the first floor. And I'll call this first, oops, first floor. And here I will reference in the lower BREP. So I come over here to BREP and say right click, say set, set one BREP, and now I set it to the bottom. So I've got my first floor and my second floor, both being referenced in. Both of them create, by default, six individual faces. So I've got my six individual faces. Those faces flow into a room. And, and at this point, I've now got two rooms, one of them named first floor the other one named second floor. So I've got two individual rooms. 
At this point, we could do a couple different things, but I like to, and I think it's best practice to use the solve adjacency tool at this point. And we want to combine our rooms together and let grass up, or let uh, honeybee uh, solve for the adjacencies between the rooms. So I'm going to merge the rooms together into a into a single tree. I could I could certainly combine them here, but just to be explicit, I'll use a, a merge command or a merge component here. And then I'll take the output from the merge. The output from the merge is just the two rooms. And then I feed that into this rooms. And then all I need to do to make this work is just turn it on using a Boolean toggle. I'll go ahead and turn that on. And let's reconfigure this just for consistency. Do that. Okay, there we go. And notice out the other end of the uh, solve adjacency, I get two rooms. So two rooms went in and two rooms came out, but Honeybee did a bunch of um, uh, adjacency solving and figuring out the right, um, the right settings to apply to the interface surfaces. So uh, these surfaces that are um, adjacent and sort of um, opposing one another, the floor of the upper volume and the ceiling of the lower volume, it's important that those are configured correctly uh, so that later on when we go to do the Energy Plus and Open Studio simulation, uh, those tools know how to know how to treat these interface zones. And so this solve adjacency component is important in that respect. So okay, so we built our rooms. So we, we've, we took our faces and we combined our faces together. We put them together into rooms. The rooms, we then solved adjacencies for the rooms against one another. And at this point, we can build our Honeybee model. So I'll come in here to Honeybee again, come to my Honeybee model, and we could then take those rooms and send those rooms off to our model. And as we talked about in our first introductory video, I could then take that model and I could send it off. I could say, you know, to Open Studio or uh, Energy Plus or you know whatever I want to want to do with that model if I want to do you know daylight assessment or whatever so that that model can then go off to wherever we want. Now for our purposes we're going to do a separate branch and I want to send that model off to the PHPP instead. So rather than uh, doing the Energy Plus simulation, I'm going to send this data, the, mo the same model, off to PHPP. So we can have this kind of branching structure here. We have the single model, and it's going to go off to different locations. So let's just get that set up. We've got our, we've got our two zones here. Let's just get that set up and um, see if this is enough for us to generate a complete PHPP. So I'm going to go up to my Passive House Tools ribbon. And in the Passive House Tools ribbon, um, in the O2 Ladybug Tools to PH, we've got this Ladybug Tools to PHPP converter. And so I'm going to grab this and drop this onto the canvas. It'll take a second to load up the libraries, but should be relatively um, uh, straightforward. And all we need to do is take our model. So let me just be clear, the only thing we're passing in is our model. Well, I guess we should give it a name. Let's give it a name. Uh, we'll call this Ed's First House. How about that? There we go. OK, so we're going to take that model and we're going to feed it into this Honeybee model input. This tool will go off and think for a second. And as we looked at in the last video, it's going to generate a series of Excel objects. Let me make this a little bigger. It's going to read and interpret and um, slice and dice the Honeybee model and turn it into a PHPP uh, uh, series of, of data points. So it's going to sort of interpret all of the Honeybee and Energy Plus items and convert them over into PHPP ready objects. And as we talked about last time, each of the, these items in the list here um, is a Excel ready object. So it has a, it knows what worksheet it should get written to. It knows what cell range it should be written to. And then it knows what value to write to that cell range. Now somehow we have to get all of this into Excel though. So uh, as we showed in the last video, we have a couple tools to do that. So we have this open Excel workbook and then this write to Excel. So we have a couple different tools here. So let's get our Excel workbook start configured first of all. So I'm going to drop this 
uh, open Excel workbook and drop that onto the canvas here. And as we talked about last time, I need to input something. I need to input a path for the source PHPP and a path for the target PHPP. And then once that's all ready, I can go ahead and um, turn it on and then that will um, that'll go off and write everything to Excel if it's all if it's all configured properly. So uh, where do I get that information? Well, we could copy it from our file viewer. I could also use this file path tool. Um, any of that would work. So I'm going to use this. I'm going to you know, just double click and type path. and That'll bring up this file path object. Right click on this object and say set one existing file. And I'm going to come to my C colon drive and go to my ladybug tools to ph example folder, which I set up ahead of time. And I'm going to select this source PHPP file and say open. And if I feed that into my panel here, you'll notice that we get C colon LBT to ph example uh, source file. Pull this over a little bit, make it a little easier. Dot XLSX. Now I could just I could also have typed that in. That would be just fine. This path guy just makes it a little, a little easier, a little faster. And remember what this is? This is just a blank PHPP. So it's just a copy of a blank PHPP. I just put it in that file, that folder for purposes of this example uh, tutorial. Now we also need to designate a target. So remember, this tool is going to make a copy of your PHPP before anything gets written to it. So we don't want to overwrite any PHPPs that you have and accidentally break anything. So we're going to always make a copy before any actual work gets done. So I'm going to say, come here. I'm going to right click and say, copy the data. And it'll come here into this panel and I'll paste it in. And I'm just going to change the name of the file. I'll call this um, uh, my results. And I'll say, OK. And so notice that I'm saving it to the exact same folder. I just give it a different name. And once this is all configured, once we have a source PHPP, and once we've given it a valid name for the target PHPP, I can just turn this on. And it'll spool up for a second and go off and turn on Excel. So once this is spooled up in my, um, in my taskbar here, you'll see that we have my results.slx. LSX, and this is a new PHPP file, and as we talked about before, it is just a blank PHPP. So that's all it is. It's just a completely blank PHPP. There's no information here whatsoever. But the important part is that we started it from within Grasshopper, and so now Grasshopper knows how to talk to that Excel file. So that Excel file and this Grasshopper file are sort of connected together, uh, in the background, and so whatever we do here in Grasshopper, we'll be able to stream out to that PHPP. So how are we going to do that? How do we connect up all of this information to that PHPP? Uh, let me delete this. We're going to use this write to PHPP workbook tool or component. So I'm going to grab this write to uh, PHPP component, and I'm going to drop that onto the canvas here. And remember, this one takes all of those Excel objects from the LBT to PH converter, takes them in as the Excel objects. And then all I need to do is say, what Excel file do I want to write it to by just connecting Excel to Excel? This will go off and think for a second. And if we were to come over and take a look at that Excel file, notice that we've got all sorts of information being written out at this point. So that's great, right? So this is all streaming out now, which is excellent. Um, that's all, that all appears to be working pretty well. Now, uh, one thing here just to, to note, um, let's take a look at this component for a second. There's a couple other things happening here that maybe it's worth uh, talking about. So this writer um, will try and do some optimization behind the scenes. So you can see right now it took a second and a half to run. This, this writer will attempt to speed things up by, uh, by checking to see if there are any new elements that it should write. So by default, uh, what this component does is it sort of looks at what Excel objects you, you sent it last time it did a write, and then it looks at the new objects and tries to only pull out the ones that have changed, the ones that are a little bit different. Um, and so for instance, over here, if we were to hook up a panel to this number of writes, you'll see that this actually only wrote 10 values. 
well that doesn't that doesn't seem right if i was to if i was to hover over here notice that we have 180 locally defined values so if that kind of thing happens if that's ever um and normally that would be a good thing normally that would be a good thing we've sort of whittled down 180 rights to only 10 rights um if you ever get in a situation where you want to force it to write all of the values no matter what, you could just set this use difference to false. So I'll say I'm just going to set this to Boolean and false. And now what we're doing is forcing this to work harder and forcing it to sort of write every single value. Notice now it's writing 180 values. It definitely took a lot longer. So we've got 180 values coming in, 180 values getting written. It definitely takes longer. Next time around, though, if I only change one parameter, I don't want it to write all 180 values. And so normally I would leave this set to true. And in that case, it won't insist on rewriting all the same values over and over and over again. The writing to Excel is the slowest part of this whole operation. And so we've tried to put in some uh, sort of efficiencies here to make that work a little better. But sometimes if, if something appears like it's not flowing through correctly, you know, one trick is to just um, force it to do the full write every time, and um, uh, that'll uh, you just do that by setting use difference to false. In any event, if I go back to our PHPP, so our PHPP, notice now we're getting all of our um, sizes through and, and everything else, um, all of our uh, all of our um, uh, uh, materials, all of the uh, surface orientations and rotations, all of that appears to be flowing through correctly. Notice also that Honeybee was smart enough to tag one of the surfaces as the roof and one of the surfaces as the floor slab. So that's really good. So we've got four walls, four walls, one roof, and one floor. So that's great. Uh, so it's smart enough to eliminate those interstitial spaces, the uh, ceiling of the first floor, the floor of the second floor, right? The, that, that sort of interface zone, those are not external exposed surfaces, so those have been omitted or filtered out of this export by default. And we can talk about how to configure all that. But so this looks like it is working correctly. Um, all of this appears to be streaming out properly. So for our purposes now, I'm going to go ahead and turn this off. So I set this to false, and that's going to turn off Excel. So if I look over here, Excel is gone. So no more Excel. That's gone. It's been shut down. Um, when we're ready, when we've gotten everything sorted, we can come back here and turn it back on. Of course, you can leave it running in the background. It's not going to hurt anything, but it'll definitely slow things down. Um, so while we're configuring our, uh, our scene and our definition here, I'm going to just leave it off. And then when it comes time for us to export again, we can go turn it on at that point. But at this point, we are basically uh, completed. So the one last thing that we should maybe do is do a little... Um, We'll do a little tidying up, uh, so just to sort of keep things manageable. Let me do this. I'll say uh, I'll put a little heading here. Scribble. Where is it? Here we go. We'll say this is export to PHPP, and let's give it a nice big uh, size so that later on, maybe that's a little too big. Later on, when our definition gets bigger, we can um, easily see what's what and what's where. And then over here, I think I'll do it this way, and we'll call this, move this all down a little bit. I'm just tidying up here, because of course these definitions do get a bit unwieldy if you don't sort of keep on top of things. And we'll call this um, create, um, well, we'll call it create honeybee rooms, thermal zones. I guess that's the other thing to just st uh, note here at the, at the um, close of this video. Um, Honeybee uses this terminology rooms now. Um, in Energy Plus, I think we would typically have called them zones in the past. They've, uh, they're using that um, room vocabulary uh, in order to indicate that they can be, I believe, to indicate that they can be exported to radiance effectively, which is great. Um, but don't, uh, don't let that throw you off. This does not have to be an individual room. Uh, this can be sort of a group of rooms. In fact, the way that we're doing it now, you know, we have a, 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 a zone which has, you know, four or five quote unquote rooms inside of it. Um, uh, of course, it can be one individual room, but I think what, what we have found is that ends up, you end up with an awful lot of components and it's uh, mostly unnecessary for the types of things we're doing. So in any event, we're going to create these honeybee rooms and um, 
you know, just to be clear, maybe we would call those zones in a past life, uh, in a past version. So we create our honeybee rooms. We then uh, make our model. We convert the model into PHPP objects, and then we export that model to PHPP. So hopefully you are able to get your definition working in much the same way. Hopefully everything is streaming out properly to your PHPP. So when we come back in the next video, we'll start to look a little more closely at how we can actually get some control over these objects. Obviously, we've got big ugly names right now. We have never assigned any material parameters or exposure types or uh, any of that type of information. So I think in the next section, the next couple of videos, we will take a look at how we start to get some control over what is being applied to the various faces inside of our model.